All right. Good evening. My name is James Whitfield. I am with Leadership Eastside. We'll talk more about what that is in a moment. But it's my job to welcome you uh, this evening uh, to Kirkland Talks about racism. Um, maybe you talk about racism all the time. And this is just a regular uh, Tuesday afternoon for you, Tuesday evening for you. But for many people, it is not a topic that we tend to spend a lot of time on for all sorts of reasons. Uh, and Debbie Lacey is going to help us uh, this evening learn a little bit more about how we can have those conversations even better. Before we do that, I have a few housekeeping uh, items that I want to make sure that I cover. The first is to point out the folks who are hosting us here this evening. Uh, and that is Lake Washington Institute of Technology. Uh, Dr. Amy Goings is here in the audience with us. Uh, thank you so much for allowing us to use this space. We really appreciate you uh, this evening. I also need to point out a person in the back. His name is Mike. Uh, everybody turn and wave at the camera. That's Mike. You need to know that Mike has been given very strict instruction uh, that he is going to record the presentation portions uh, of this evening so that people who were not able to make it here uh, are able to uh, watch it later. However, uh, when you are turning to talk to your neighbor or anything else where you all are talking, Mike is going to turn off the camera. So uh, you will not be on camera. What you say will not be on camera. You are not being recorded at all. Uh, this evening. Just want to make sure that you know that. Last but certainly not least, I want to make sure that you know where the restrooms are. Uh, they are out, uh, I believe, around this corner. Uh, that, that way is the restrooms. Uh, and if there is some sort of an emergency, um, run. Like, run. <laughs> run out of the room. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we have the chief of police in the room. Listen to her. That's, all, that's what I'm saying. Like... If Chief Harris says to do something, like, do that. That's my, that's our emergency moment. Hope that you feel safer now. Uh, all right, so let's keep moving. Uh, the Welcoming Kirkland Initiative uh, is what brings us here uh, today. There's a lot of words here, but I think it's useful for me to actually walk through all of them. Uh, the city of Kirkland has contracted with Leadership East Side. That's an organization that I am with to design, coordinate, and implement a, a comprehensive community engagement project to engage Kirkland residents, businesses, nonprofits, and the city, including police, on how we function together for the health of the overall community. The initiative was launched to respond to express concerns that people of color in general, and black people in particular, have lived experience, uh, experiences of an unwelcoming and inequitable community in contrast to the city's stated goal to be safe inclusive, and welcoming for all. Again, that's a lot of words, but one of the things that I think is really important is to point out that uh, the effort here is bringing people together to think about how the city of Kirkland can sort of close the values gap, right? There's an aspiration to be self-inclusive, to be safe, inclusive, and welcoming for all. And at least one part of the community uh, has articulated that that's not how they feel. Now, it doesn't mean that other parts of the community don't also have that same concern. However, um, the Welcoming Kirkland Initiative, uh, as in its current state, is really focused on people of color uh, and black people uh, in particular, which is one of the reasons why this evening we're talking about racism. Uh, and so there are two different uh, sort of strains of work that come out of Welcoming Kirkland. Uh, the first is uh, a set of conversations and work around changing and improving uh, the protocols between business community uh, and the police. Uh, and there, well, we can keep you updated if you sign up uh, at uh, Kirkland at leadershipeside.com. That's Kirkland at leadershipeside.com. That's the way that you can make sure that you can get in more information about how that piece of the work is coming. That's also the place that you can sign up to make sure that you are um, continue to kept in, kept in the loop on the second item around a series of community learning events uh, about racism that falls under the Kirkland Talks banner. The reason that Leadership Eastside Side was contracted, I think, primarily comes down to, the, to Ellie's core beliefs and core values. Uh, it's probably worth taking a moment and just organize ourselves around that. The first uh, thing to know is that across the left-hand side here 
our, our Leadership Besides uh, three core beliefs. The first is that Leadership Beside believes everyone deserves to thrive. Ellie believes that collaboration transcends silos and narrow interests. And Ellie believes that the people affected by an issue should be involved in their solutions. Each one of those core beliefs then results in two core values. Uh, Ellie values genuine human connection and authentic relationships. We call that authenticity. Ellie values positive change through continuous learning and adaptation. We call that impact. Ellie values engaging in ways that are best for the whole. Uh, the shorthand for that for us is shared responsibility. And Ellie values collective solutions and actions, benefiting from competing, uh, conflicting and competing perspectives. Our shorthand for that is courageous collaboration. I want to pause here and say this is one of the things that makes Leadership Beside so different. We believe conflict is a gift. We really do try to create spaces where people can bring differences of perspective in order for us to all benefit uh, from the fact that we do look at the world in different ways. Ellie values underrepresented voices. We call that purposeful inclusion. And Ellie values disruption of racial and other inequities. We call that equity. So uh, we are working currently uh, on helping to create a more welcoming community through community learning. Uh, and so this is our Kirkland Talks about racism series. There will be three topics. Tonight's is our first topic, uh, preparing to be color conscious and color brave. Um, each one of the topics will have one sort of large open training like this, uh, and then two skill building dialogues uh, that will focus on the same topic area. Again, if you're interested, uh, and being notified about how to participate in those, please sign up at kirkland at leadershipeside.com. Um, and the goal, I just want to point out that we really are focused on learning and healing, right? So our, one of the reasons that we're gathered uh, on the na National Day of Racial Healing is because it is one of the core tenets of the work that we're trying to do uh, is really focus on healing the relationships in our community. Uh, and so people around the country have been gathered in all sorts of ways uh, today on the National Day of Racial Healing, which offers people, organizations, and communities across the United States opportunities to recognize the need for racial healing and bring people together to take collective action for a more just and equitable world. So with that in mind, uh, I'm going to bring up the person who's going to lead our training this evening. Uh, her name is Debbie Lacey. I'm going to put this down so that I can do justice to her introduction. Okay. So, Debbie has over 20 years of experience in nonprofit leadership, group facilitation, intercultural competency, and coalition building. She co-founded the Eastside Refugee and Immigrant Coalition in 2002 and helped bring the welcoming movement to our community. She is passionate about inclusive dialogues, civic power, placemaking, and other efforts that strengthen our sense of agency and belonging. She and her leadership team recently launched East Side for All, the first race and social justice advocacy organization mobilizing East King County communities to transform policies, practices, relationships, and investments. She is also a known commodity and loved by many of us here uh, in the East Side community, particularly in her hometown of Kirkland. Please join me in welcoming Debbie Lacey. Thank you, James. Appreciate it. Hi, everybody. How are you? A little louder. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Um, I also will invite you to, um, throughout the evening, we we'll just have a short amount of time together, relatively short. I know for many of you, you had a long journey here tonight. Um, not so easy to, to get around campus if this is your first time here, even if you've been here before, but not in the dark. Um, in the rain, so we really appreciate you making the journey. Um, and uh, as we go through the evening, um, there'll be a couple of points where I will invite you to connect with one another. Uh, but again, this isn't our dialogue format. We're not gonna go deeply into um, some of the pieces with one another. This is meant to be an overview, a preparation, just like the title says. And when those times come for you to connect with others, um, feel free to fill in some of the seats. Um, would love to see, see you more connected. Um, so if that feeling comes over you uh, while I'm talking tonight, please feel free to move and stretch and, and find new places in the room to connect with others. 
when I was thinking about um, preparing for dialogues, and particularly dialogues about race, I realized in looking past um, all the work that I've done in this area is that a lot of prep um, goes into the content, of course, the, the format, the venue, all, all the details, right? But we rarely get prepared ourselves as participants for how to show up in these conversations, for how to navigate them. And sometimes what ends up happening is that we just touch the surface. We sign up for a courageous conversation, right? We go, we, we, we do our, 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 our work to get there and to be present. And then there's, can, there can be sometimes a lot of tiptoeing around, or there can be some, um, some places where there are missteps um, and challenges that happen. And we don't always know how to lean into those and move through them. So I thought it would be really helpful, and I'm, I'm glad this is being recorded as a way to kind of give a, a 101, if you will, to, to people who want to engage in these dialogues more. And so that's what tonight's about. It's helping to prepare ourselves and uh, to connect with some of those skills and things that we need to, to move through and into conversations in really meaningful ways, ways that can be transformative and not just keep touching the surface over and over again. So to that, I am going to come over here and we're going to pull up the transcript drip of this audio. So John Powell, um, and he prefers to have his name in lowercase. Um, when you see names on the screen, they are the ways that people prefer them to be written. Um, so he is the director of the Othering and Belonging Institute, has a fantastic conference every year. If you have a chance to go, um, please do. And uh, that was formerly known as the Haas Institute for a Fair and Inclusive Society. And he was interviewed by Krista Tippett. So these things are not simple. I mean, there's some things we can do, but as we lean into it, we'll find them, they're more and more complicated. Uh, but they're also fascinating. I mean, this is sort of an interesting world we live in. It's so important that you name the problems and then you talk about how fascinating this is, right? There's something about us defining, going into these conversations and going into the deliberations about what's to be done, treating it as a problem and an issue and a burden. And it may be all of those things but also life-giving work and fascinating work. I think that's right. That will make us, each one of us, more whole. Well, part of the thing, you know, as a country, we really don't like talking about race. And part of it is because it's a hard conversation, and oftentimes we do it badly. And, uh, you know, it's like if you have a party, and you invite people to your party, and it's a bad party, you know? Then you say, I'll come have another party next weekend. It's like, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm out of town. Uh, but it's like, come, let's talk about white privilege. And uh, <laughs> I think I'm busy. <laughs> so some of us can relate. Um, so I think that we leave some things out when we think about talking about these kind of conversations. And uh, one of the things that's, I think, important to name is that um, when we can have awareness about our own individual challenges with these conversations, whether you're a person of color, whether you're a white person, whether you've done the work around this or you haven't, or you're somewhere in between, there's a calling to us to have that self-awareness. Um, in December, I got to see the poet David White um, here in Seattle, and he said half of self-awareness is understanding all the ways we're reluctant to have the conversation. And I just thought that was really poignant and, and important to, to this topic specifically. Um, so what, what John Powell speaks about is, is real. There's a, something called racial anxiety. It's a real thing. Um, and there's a lot of people doing some great research on this um, right now, and it's worth looking up if you're interested. Um, but basically what happens is that what we know that happens is is that, you know, not, not surprisingly, right, this is a topic that does raise anxiety for people. And when we interact and show up with one another and we are from different backgrounds and races, um, this, this anxiety kicks in. And generally, this is not 100%, um, this is, this is um, you know, just kind of what the research is showing about um, generally what white people are concerned about what kind of is at the root of their anxiety um, when they come for dialogues and conversations about race, and that is the fear of being called a racist, the fear of being perceived as a racist. Um, people of color show up worrying that they will actually experience racism. OK? 
okay? Uh, and then when you have that going on, um, there's unconscious shifts in our nonverbal behavior, right? So they, they have noted, um, they hooked people up, you know, to all the, the wires and such, and uh, measured some of their nonverbal reactions and, and the tone of their voice and all kinds of things, and they found that people's voices elevated, higher pitch, um, their, their body language changed, um, became more rigid and less smiling, things like that, less welcoming overall, right? And so what that serves to do is it actually creates a contagious anxiety. So when you're, if you yourself are not feeling that anxiety, but you are with someone in the presence of someone who is anxious, kind of makes us anxious. We may not even be conscious that we're picking up on that, but we are. And so um, we take that on, and then all the assumptions start going back and forth. Why is this person looking at me like this? Why is this person looking so stiff? Why do they look like they're afraid of me? Okay? And then I start using, then my body language becomes rigid in response. I become guarded, stiff, unsmiling, waiting, right? So we make up a lot of stories and assumptions about what's going on when we, have, when we see those behaviors, and it's natural to do that. Um, you know, one of the things that I think then leads to that funnel um, spiraling downward is that then we become more vulnerable to being triggered even more. Because we're tuned in now. Okay, now, we, now we've got a heightened sense of awareness happening because there's anxiety in the room. And so now I'm going to be very vigilant. Okay, and that, and that helps, um, helps to discourage the, the connection. And then by that time, now we're focused on self-protection. Now you're no longer thinking about other and connecting with other, listening to understand. You're thinking about, how do I get out of here okay? Right? How do I make sure nothing bad happens to me um, while I'm here? Uh, and how do I get through it? So I want to just try a little experiment here. I want you to imagine, this is, this is kind of a metaphor, I think, for how we, how we often show up for conversations like this. And it is kind of like bracing for a punch to the gut. Okay? So I want you to right now, just imagine, someone's about to come up to you and punch you in the gut. Brace for that. Okay, what are you doing? Clenching your stomach? Holding your breath? Okay, keep doing that. Now take a nice, full, deep breath. While you're clenching your stomach. Those two things don't go together, right? But some of us, when we show up for these conversations, we're bracing for a punch because we've been punched before, right? And we really are concerned that we're going to experience that again. And so what we're asking of, of folks who have been through that, people of color in particular who've been through that, um, but I know white people have had experiences in the past of where the very thing that they fear has happened to them, okay? And now they're, they're trying to take a risk and show up again, they're bracing for the punch. And it's very, very difficult to be um, open and um, have that soft-bellied way of inviting the other in uh, when we're in that mode. So at this point, I would think I want to invite um, James up, because what I want to talk about is how we can flip that funnel around, okay? How we can interrupt this, this pattern um, that can happen. And if James grabs that... You're not going to punch me in the stomach. I am right? not going to punch you in the stomach. Because yeah, I'm just soft-bellied all the time. I don't have a, I don't have a different do speed. <laughs> this is good. Uh, I'm going to think about that later. How, how we could build that one in, do a little different kind of a demo for you. But no, this is a demo on some of the practices that we will learn and build skills around with regards to dialogue. So some of the things that I'm going to just do quickly is um, the things that we're teaching you for um, and the rest of the community for about dialogue. So one of the things we're going to do is I'm going to ask a question and we're going to pause um, before we answer. Because a lot of times when we're, when we're sitting down for a conversation and we have a list of questions in front of us, or even there's a facilitator that's doling out the questions one at a time, it's Q&A, Q&A, Q&A. Somebody asks a question, you're expected to answer. And you're not listening to the other person while they're telling their story, right? Because you're so worried. And so you're thinking about what you're gonna say and how you're gonna say it right. So what we do is we pause. So the first thing that we're gonna do, and this, and this is, but you'll be doing this in a moment, so is we're just gonna, we're gonna in, introduce ourselves, okay? 
And I'm going to encourage you to turn to someone near you that you don't know, already know to do these exercises here today. And we're going to answer, um, fill in the blank here with this, finish the sentence. A fear or concern I have about racism in our community is, and a hope I hold is. And we're going to have about 30 seconds each to answer this. And so you'll see this handy dandy little timer going. So I'm gonna start and I'm gonna say, hi, I'm Debbie. You don't have to shake hands unless you're comfortable with that, but I am, and I know James is. Hi, Debbie. I'm Debbie, and I've lived in this area for about 24 years. And a fear or concern I have about racism in our community is that as we step more into these conversations, that there will be more backlash, and we will see more hate. And the hope I hold is that more people like this will show up and stand up against hate and help support people who need that support in our community. Good answer. Thank you. Wow. No time for applause, though. Well, I, was, I was pausing. I was going. pausing. I know. I was pausing. Yes, we paused. So my name is James. Uh, I have lived in this area since 2003. Uh, a fear or concern that I have uh, is that my children, uh, who are now adults, won't want to live in this community uh, due to concerns about racism. Uh, and a hope that I have is that due to efforts like this, uh, they and my eventual grandchildren will in fact uh, be able to live here. Nice. See that? Okay, so. Good, thank you. I got one person get an answer, okay, all right. It's okay, it's good. So it's your turn, so I'm just gonna give you a moment to kind of scope out another person. And I know there can be a tendency to like, oh, can three or four of us, no, sorry. <laughs> really, if you do not have a partner, um, so I want you to scope out right now and, and get yourselves connected up, you can move around. But if you do not have a partner, I want you to raise your hand and then find each other. I can already tell this is a, a, an above average audience because you followed instruction and you played well and nicely and I thank you. So um, we have some excellence in the room with us tonight and I'm just so happy that we can uh, continue forward with the rest of the evening, what we have planned. So I want to now um, introduce the, the focus for tonight with regards to color consciousness and being color brave. So how many of you have seen Melody Hobson's TED Talk? Several, but not a lot. So look it up. It's very, very good. Um, we're not going to watch the TED Talk tonight. We're going to watch a different talk in a little bit. Um, but Melody Hobson is the president and co-CEO of the Ariel um, Investments, and she was formerly with um, the chairman, chairwoman of DreamWorks um, Animation, and she's just an incredible woman with um, a, an extensive background in nonprofit and arts. She's also, um, I believe, the vice chair of the board for the Starbucks Corporation, and so she, um, in 2014, put out this um, TED Talk on um, color brave versus color bright blindness, and so just very quickly to review a bit about color blindness is that you know it's. Um, it's definitely considered something that's, at this point, not helpful. Um, one of the more outdated um, ideologies when it comes to race relations in the United States. Um, it came about um, with, we hope, um, good intention, but actually in reality it, it, it does not play out that way. because. Um, while it, it seems on the surface to be about equality, and you'll we'll hear things like, I don't see color, I, I see people for who they are, I don't see um, different races, um, I teach my children to, to see people for who they are and not their race, that kind of thing. Um, people are all the same, so we should be all treated the same, okay? So what, that hap what happens in practice is that, um, of course, dismisses the, the reality that we're in and that we have been in. It also um, supports sameness in the way that sameness is an ideal where ideal good is white culture. And that that is the sameness that we're talking about um, when we say we are all the same. We are actually not um, including the cultural heritage and the unique perspectives and, and different experiences of everybody when we do that. And so um, what Melody and others um, are calling us to do is to move into a frame for being color brave. 
And so she talks very much about um, some stories about why this is important to her, um, particularly in the business world. And um, she gives some great examples. And then she talks um, really to all of us. She talks about what, what does it mean to be color brave? And she talks about, now get this, paying attention to the differences. Makes sense. She says, observe closely, purposefully, and intentionally. And we, of course, we can't always tell by looking what people's race is or their cultural background or a whole bunch of stuff about them by just looking at them, right? But it is a start to saying, I see you. It's a start to saying, I see you. And then she says, be proactive. Be proactive about your conversations about race. Um, do that honestly with courage and understanding. And by the way, these slides will be available for you. We also have some handouts that you will um, have later on too. So just know that you'll um, get everything that you need to support anything that you want to check back over later. And then she says, invite people into your life who don't look like you, don't think like you, don't act like you, don't come from where you come from. And I think it was Oprah, correct me if I'm wrong. She said, you know, you can, you can learn a lot about somebody by who they have in their kitchen who they invite into their kitchen. So a lot of times what happens in our, in our communities is that we're still very segregated and we may have colleagues or um, you know, others that go to, we go to school with who are different from us racially, culturally, and otherwise, but we don't really invite them into our kitchens. And if you just take a moment and think about who's been in your kitchen in the past month, might give you some insights a little bit into that. Now this is different from all of us, so I'm not suggesting that you start inviting a whole bunch of strangers over <laughs> into your kitchen. I'll come though. <laughs> James will probably come. But we're not strangers anymore, right? So, um, but it's just, it's just a way of thinking about that, about who we invite in, right? And that that is, that is a color brave action when we extend invitations, when we, have, um, when we initiate the conversations, and when we focus our attention on the ways in which we are different and unique. Uh, these are all ways of being color brave. And there's another, there's a handout that you'll have available to you at the end of the night called Emptying the Knapsack, which is um, kind of a riff on the famous Peggy McIntosh article, Unpacking the Invisible Knapsack. And there's a whole list of um, color brave actions that the author um, recommends there. So what's required to be color brave? I'm gonna need my helper for the TED video now. Um, so as we're getting this uh, video set up, this is just about a 12 minute video, and it's um, Jay Smooth. Uh, Jay Smooth is um, a veteran hip hop DJ, and he um, founded New York's longest running hip hop radio show called The Underground Railroad, and now he's um, known for his uh, video blogs. How do you, what does he call it? Vlogs? Thank you. Oh, vlogs. <laughs> I don't vlog, so it's just new vocabulary. So here's um, Mr. Smooth. I'm going to talk a little bit about race um, tonight. Or to be more precise, I want to talk about how we talk about race, um, how we engage in race conversations, and uh, how we might get a little bit better at it in some ways. And that's a topic that I have always enjoyed. Most Americans avoid race conversations like the plague. And uh, we often take our ability to avoid it and use it as a measure of our progress and enlightenment, which I think is kind of telling in and of itself. <laughs> but I've always been drawn to those conversations and fascinated by them, in part because growing up as a very light-skinned uh, black man of mixed descent, um, I often find myself in these sort of peculiar race-based conversations. Um, you know, oftentimes when I'm meeting someone for the first time, rather than making small talk, they'll immediately present me with a philosophical conundrum. They will ask, what are you? And, you know, I'll have to explain I'm not a philosophy major, and you know, my father is black and one is white, and what are we? Um, so I've always, so I've, I've always had a passion for uh, studying and observing how we communicate about race and how we might be a little better at certain aspects of that communication. And I made a video commentary named How to Tell Someone They Sound Racist. 
uh, which talks about a particular type of race conversation, which usually doesn't involve any explicit racist intent. There's no blatant racism involved. It usually involves well-intentioned people, but uh, in, it's a situation where one of us feels the need to tell someone that something they said may have had connotations they weren't aware of, or they may have done something that had a hurtful impact that they might not have been aware of. And that's a conversation we all find ourselves in from time to time. And it's a conversation that usually goes horribly. Uh, <laughs> because no matter how clear you try to be in conveying that you're not attacking the person, you're just trying to offer a specific critique about something that just happened. When we are receiving that sort of critique, we tend to deeply personalize it and take it as personal attack. And we tend to respond by saying, are you saying that I am racist? How can you say I am a good person? Why would you say that I am a racist? And you try to explain, I'm talking about a particular thing. And you say, no, I am not a racist. And what started out as a what you said conversation turns into a what you are conversation, a what I am conversation, which is a dead end that produces nothing except mutual frustration. And you never wind up seeing eye to eye or finding any common ground. Um, so in my video, I offered some suggestions for how we might stay focused on the what you said conversation and find some common ground. And that video, most videos on YouTube die off after 48 hours, but this video really struck a chord, which I think shows how hungry many of us are to find better ways to communicate on these issues. And the two types of feedback I get most commonly on that video are one, I really appreciated the perspective you gave about staying focused on what you are conversation. And the second type of feedback I get is, I tried these strategies you suggested about staying on the what you are conversation, and they actually never work. Um, and this is true, unfortunately. Um, no matter what angle you take as far as voicing that critique, the vast majority of the time, it's still going to lapse into a defensive what I am conversation. And I think framing it as clearly as you can that what you said form is still valuable because it makes the substance of your beef as clear as possible to other people observing the conversation, especially in public discourse. And it gives both of you the best shot at finding common ground and seeing eye to eye. It's worth going for that 10%, but generally the success rate might be higher here at Hampton College. But where, where I live on the internet, uh, the success rate tends to be around 10%. So since I made that video and took in that feedback, I've been thinking about what other approaches you might be able to take. And I think since we can never entirely fix that conversation by changing how we voice the critique, I think we might be able to also make it budge a little bit by considering how we receive that critique and how we might be able to take a suggestion that we may have said or done something racist and uh, take it in stride and not completely freak out and assume that the world thinks that I'm a bad person. So the first thing that makes it difficult to accept that critique that uh, you may have said something racist is simply that it involves the possibility that you made a mistake and none of us takes that too well none of us enjoys that but in most other situations when the possibility arises that we made a mistake we are usually able to take a few deep breaths and tell ourselves i'm only human everyone makes mistakes but when it comes to conversations involving race and prejudice for some reason, we tend to make the opposite assumption. We deal with race and prejudice with this all or nothing, good person, bad person binary in which either you are racist or you are not racist. And if you're not bad in a thousand, then you're striking out every time. And this puts us in a situation where we're, we're striving to meet an impossible standard. And if anything less than perfection means that uh, you are a racist, that means any suggestion that you've made a mistake, any suggestion that you've been less than perfect, is a suggestion that you're a bad person. So we become averse to any suggestion that we should consider our thoughts and actions. And it makes it harder for us to work on our imperfections. When you believe that you must be perfect in order to be good, it makes you averse to recognizing your own inevitable imperfections and that lets them stagnate and grow. So the belief that you must be perfect in order to be good is an obstacle to being as good as you can be. So it would make our conversations with each other a lot smoother and it would make us better at being good if we could uh, recognize that we're not perfect and embrace that. Um, so I want to offer a couple of things that you can keep in mind when you need to remind yourself that I'm not supposed to be perfect when it comes to navigating race. And the first thing is that anytime we're dealing with race issues, we are dealing with a social construct that was not born 
out of any science or reason or logic, we are grappling with a social construct that was not designed to make sense. And to the extent that it is the product of design, uh, the race constructs that we live in in America were shaped specifically by a desire to avoid making sense. You know, they were shaped for centuries by a need to rationalize and justify indefensible acts. So when we grapple with race issues, we're grappling with something that was designed for centuries to uh, make us circumvent our best instincts. It's, it, it, it's a dance partner that's designed to trip us up. So just based on that alone, we should be able to keep in mind that you will never bat a thousand when it comes to dealing with race issues. And the other uh, thing that we need to keep in mind is, as we are all imperfect humans, and uh, as has been laid out in some of the other talks this evening, we all have uh, unconscious thought processes and psychosocial mechanisms that prop up. There are many things in our day-to-day -day lives that lead us towards developing little pockets of prejudice, that lead us towards acting unkind to others without having any intent to do so. These are things that we're just naturally develop in our day-to-day -day lives. So the problem with that all or nothing binary is it causes us to look at racism and prejudice as if they are akin to having tonsils. I mean, you either have tonsils or you don't. And if you get, so if you've had if you've had your prejudice removed, you never need to consider it. <laughs> so if, someone, if someone says, if someone says, I think you may have a little unconscious prejudice, you say, well, no, I did. My prejudice was removed in 2005. <laughs> I went to see that movie crash. It's all good. Um, but that's not how these things work. When you go through your day-to-day -day lives, there are all of these uh, mass media and social stimuli, as well as processes that we all have inside our brains that we're not aware of, that cause us to build up little pockets of prejudice every day, just like plaque develops on our teeth. <laughs> so we need to move away from the tonsils paradigm of race discourse towards the dental hygiene paradigm of race discourse. I can offer one piece of advice. And in general, I think we need to move away from the premise that being a good person is a fixed, immutable characteristic, and shift towards seeing being good as a practice. And it is a practice that we carry out by engaging with our imperfections. So we need to shift from, we need to shift towards uh, thinking of being a good person the same way we think of being a clean person. Being a clean person is something that you maintain and uh, work on every day. We don't assume that uh, I'm a clean person, therefore I don't need to brush my teeth. And when someone suggests to us that we've got something stuck in our teeth, you know, so what do you I have something stuck in my teeth, I'm a clean person. Well, <laughs> so I know that this is no small task, but if we can shift a little bit closer towards uh, viewing those race conversations the same way we view a conversation about something stuck in our teeth. It will go a long way uh, towards making our conversations a bit smoother and allow us to uh, work together on bigger issues around race because there are a lot of, uh, beyond the persistent conversational awkwardness of race, there are persistent systemic and institutional issues around race that are not caused by conversation and they can't be entirely solved by conversation. You can't talk them away, but we need people to work together and coordinate and communicate to find strategies to work on those systemic issues because despite all of the barriers that we've broken, all of the apparent markers of progress, there are still so many disparities if you look at unemployment rate, infant mortality rate, incarceration rates, uh, median household income. There are so many disparities um, on the various sides of the color lines in this country um, that it is worthwhile for us to iron out these conversational issues, if for nothing else, so that we can get a little bit closer to working together on those big issues. So I hope that we can, uh, if I could add one wish, it would be that we would reconsider how we conceptualize being a good person and just keep in mind that we are not good despite our imperfections. It is the connection we maintain with our imperfections that allows us to be good. Our connection with our personal and common imperfections, being mindful of those personal and common imperfections, is what allows us to be good to each other and be good to ourselves. So, <laughs> so I 
know that this is no easy task, and race may be the most difficult sphere in which to apply this concept, but I think it's where it could also reap the most rewards. So I hope that bit by bit, if we consider that and are mindful of it, um, we can shift away from taking it as an indictment of our goodness and move towards taking it as a gesture of respect and an act of kindness when someone tells us that we've got something racist stuck in our teeth. <laughs> You like that? Yeah. Love Jay Smooth. And you can look up his other video, too, about how to tell someone they're racist. Um, interesting. Good to, to check out. Um, so one of the things that I wanted to name um, about color consciousness and being color brave is that sometimes people think that's just for white people. That that's just what we're talking about when we mean that. We mean that for white people to be more color conscious and color brave. And I think that that's kind of where most of the work or a lot of the work lies, but by no means all the work. So I wanted to share just a little example of my own process with this, of how I personally have become more color conscious and color brave. And one of the things that I had a long history of um, that I started noticing first in my 20s was um, the go along to get along approach. So the way that this worked for me was that as a person of color, in order to not call attention to myself, because when people seemed to notice me, they would ask me, what are you? Or they might even say something that was offensive. I, I had been on the receiving end of racist comments growing up in a mostly white community in the, in the Midwest. Um, so I, I would um, try to minimize the, the, the visibility that I had. And what this meant was that I did not have the courage often to address comments that were made, sometimes by my own family members. Um, and so I developed this way of uh, having a default mode that was really about um, a coping strategy. And later on, um, and this was just yesterday, I've just taken me a long time. No, it wasn't just yesterday. <laughs> And it was many years. I, um, I recognized that uh, that was harmful to me. And what I wanted to get to a place of was having that be a conscious decision, whether I chose to go along to get along in the moment or not, rather than having it be a default unconscious mode. Does that make sense? So for me, being color brave was about recognizing opportunities when I can initiate a conversation that I would have passed by before out of self-protection and the need to be invisible and not rock the boat, and um, to, to step forward into that conscious place of, no, I choose this today in this particular interaction at this particular time because it suits me and my values. And so I'm not saying that I never, ever go along to get along anymore. I still do that, but when I do that, it's a conscious choice. And so I think that even, um, that we all have something around being color conscious and color brave that is for each of us individually to decide. Um, I am not going to give you a menu of things that you should be doing um, to be more color conscious and color brave. That's, that's up to you. Um, you get to decide that. And what I hope for, though, is that you recognize that these can be conscious decisions that you make and that there is a, um, a continuum. And you can, you can be wherever you are today and you can take steps forward on that, on that continuum. So tools for showing up for these conversations. One of the first things that we want to do is we want to talk about, well, why show up in the first place? So you all showed up tonight. You had different reasons for being here, I'm sure. Um, some of you may have come to just find out what is this all about? What's Kirkland doing? What's Kirkland up to when it comes to some of the challenges that our community is facing? Some of you came because you wanted to learn something, build awareness, maybe connect with others, curiosity, all kinds of reasons. But every time we engage, and make the decision to show up, it's really important as we're walking in the door, if we haven't done it before that, to think about what is it I hope to get out of this? How do I wanna be and what do I wanna leave with? And that really is that first step 
to interrupting that anxiety spiral I was talking about. Because without your intention, it's, it's kind of like you're without a lighthouse. So that the moment that you step into a room like this, or it, let's say it's a small um, group conversation, if you haven't set that intention in advance, now all that you're doing, all that you have um, available to you is whatever's around you. And you're picking up on everybody else's energy, and you're, you're waiting to make sure you're in the right place, and you're about to say the right thing. So starting with the intention is really important. And at this point, I need a little help from the great team at Leadership Eastside folks to help me pass out a handout. So the rest of them you're going to have access to after the talk. Thank you. And um, are there, you don't really need pens for this, um, but if we have them, it might be helpful to grab those. Um, and so this is um, a little excerpt from a woman named Kathy O'Bear, who's um, a trainer of facilitators. And she herself, as a white woman, has done her own work with regards to social justice and how she facilitates for social justice. So for example, there's a concept in facilitation work that facilitators are neutral, that they should be neutral. And she pushes against that. She challenges that because she has a firm value in social justice and she believes in being able to take her role as a facilitator and in a skilled um, way um, initiating a conversation and guiding it and recognizing the power that she has to do that as the facilitator. So anyway, she has come up with um, some really great strategies that I think um, certainly apply to these kind of conversations. And you'll note this goal up here. What do you think about this goal? Not to avoid discomfort, but to stay present while feeling uncomfortable so that you can meet your intention. Sometimes we equate comfort with safety and there's a lot of reasons why we do that and some of us need to do that because of the history of what we've experienced as individuals and as a people in the community and in this society. However, when we have made the choice to show up and we then proceed to do everything possible to stay as comfortable as possible until we walk out of the door, it's kind of like showing up for a potluck buffet and just eating the dish that you brought. So you have to take the risks. And so staying present, being uncomfortable so that you can fulfill your intention. Um, as you glance through that list, um, and, and there's many more um, pieces to that than I've shared with you. I just didn't want to overwhelm with all her body of work. But it's, it's great, and it's worth um, checking out. Um, but I want you to think about um, kind of your individual personal concerns when and if you show up for conversations about race. And by the way, I'm not, when I say conversation about race, I'm not just talking about forums like this or structured dialogues. I'm talking about that color brave piece that said, what about initiating that with a coworker? What about initiating that with your great uncle who said something at Christmas dinner? Um, you know, this is what I'm talking about. So when we meet for dialogue, and I hope you all will join us in early February um, for those, those sessions, um, when we meet for dialogue, it's not just about what's happening there. Sometimes people poo-poo dialogues, and I get real defensive, and I say, you know what? <laughs> it's not about sitting around talking and feeling good that we're doing that. It's because you get to practice having the tough conversations in your day-to-day -day life in a setting that is supportive and learning where we can learn together and practice that. So that's what that's for. So when you think about entering these kind of conversations, whether it's a structured dialogue or just a one-on-one -on -one opportunity for, for a conversation to take place with another person, which of these are potential concerns of, you, of yours? You know, which, which of those um, show up for you? And maybe it's something that's not on that list. Um, but I want you to think about that. And then we're about to do a partner thing again. Let me get my clicker. Encourage you to meet a new person, all right? 
And so you'll want to do the introduction again, how long you've lived here. And then you want to think about if my fear or concern, and you want to name that, were to happen when I was having one of these brave, courageous conversations, here's what I want to remember to think, feel, or do. So oftentimes we think about the worst case scenario and we stop there. We hesitate before we initiate the conversation, ask the question, challenge the person in front of us because we're worried. And what we need to do is give ourselves credit, give the other person credit, and give the process the credit for thinking through that all the way to the other side. Okay, if that were to happen, then what would you do? And if that were to happen, then what would you do? That's the skill. Because if we, if we stop at the fear, then all we're going to be doing is protecting ourselves and trying to stay comfortable the whole time. But there is another side. There's a through way there that we can experience if we go through this exercise. So I, I would really encourage you to share something that you legitimately are concerned about happening if you were to have more brave conversations. And then think it through a little bit. Well, if that were to happen, then I would. OK? And so you're each going to have a minute. And um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to build your introduction into the minute. So you'll have a f one person will have a full minute to say, I'm so-and-so, and I've lived here for X number of years. And if, if a worry that I have is, and if that were to happen, I would full minute for that. And then the, your partner will, will also change, um, do the same thing. So this is an opportunity race looking at me like, <laughs> it's, it's really going to be OK. So get up. <laughs> find a partner. And I will tell you when to start, because um, I don't want you to, I want you to have your pause. So I can already tell that you all want to be in the dialogues. Come on now. The dialogues are coming up, OK? And those are small group formats. So those are uh, about four or five people at a table. And what we do at our dialogues is we dive more into these topics that we present at these community learning sessions. So I know this is a group that really wants a dialogue. I'm so pleased to see you engaging. And, and did you notice, so the pause, the breath, we forget that all the time, folks. If we could just remember that before we speak, before we sit down with someone to listen to their story, before we share our own story, if we could set our intention, um, I think we can make our way through these conversations in a way that doesn't um, stir up all the things that can get in the way for us. So speaking about preparing ourselves um, for these conversations, um, you know, we need different things. Obviously, um, what I need to step into these kind of conversations is different from what you need, different from what you need, and what you need, and what you need. So um, that's the part of that self-awareness I was talking about before. Super important to find out where you are with these things. What, what are your triggers? What, what gets you nervous? What are you concerned about? What's your intention? And then thinking about what you need in order to show up fully, be present, and for you to do the work required of that conversation, the work required of you. What do you need? So recently, um, I have an eight-year-old son, and he started doing parkour. Anybody know about parkour? So what I knew about parkour was what I saw on YouTube videos, and it really scared me because there's these kids that like will skateboard down railings and stuff and flights of stairs, and I'm thinking, I don't know um, about this. and. My, my son is not a daredevil type either, so I was really curious how he was going to approach this. Um, but we didn't have to worry, because we went to a place in Redmond um, that is awesome. Move free, <laughs> yes. It is awesome. <laughs> so I was just super impressed, because here's what they're teaching the kids. First of all, it's a, it is a risky activity. They're doing obstacles, they're, they're jumping onto things, they're jumping off of things. Um, they're really testing their limits physically, mentally too. And um, one of the things they kept emphasizing from the very, very first class was, this is about you. This is about you paying attention to your body, listening to yourself, and you're competing against no one else here. This is about you. 
And so that self-awareness and that consciousness about knowing um, what your body's weaknesses and strengths are in that moment, challenging yourself to move a little bit past, um, these were all showing up in the parkour. And I thought, that's really cool. What a great example for so many other things where we want to do that risky thing. We know it's gonna be good for us, it's gonna be healthy, it's gonna be challenging, it's gonna help us grow. But God, that's really scary. So how do we do that? How do we prepare ourselves in advance? And while we're there, how do we listen? How do we listen to ourselves? How do we watch out for others around us so we're not bumping into each other, right? So I think that this part about thinking about what we need, we all need something different when it comes to mind, heart, and body preparation. And we need something different. Um, also, people of color have different work in this, as I mentioned before, than white people do. Okay, so that preparation is different. And, we'll, when, and we learn more about that preparation the more we go into it. The deeper we go, the more we realize we don't know or the areas that we want to strengthen and deepen, right? So I think that um, one of the things that I wanted to point out with regards to that anxiety spiral is that there's some interesting research being done by a woman named Song Richardson at UCI in Berkeley and uh, UCI California, and she was talking about how what they're finding in the research is the white people that are experiencing the most racial anxiety in cross-racial conversations and discussions are the people who are the most egalitarian. They highly value equality and equity. They're the ones who try the most. They have the most anxiety. Now that makes sense, but then she talked about the rest of that Piece, the, the picture that gets painted, gets painted in the research, and that is the people, the white people with the least amount of anxiety in cross-racial conversations are the people who have the most extreme views when it comes to white supremacy. Because they do not care. Can you say that again? The people who have the least amount of anxiety meeting and talking and trying to connect with people of color um, or other people of other races are those that have the highest amount of white supremacist views. And it is because they do not care what the black person in front of them thinks of them. So the good news is <laughs> when you are feeling anxiety in these kind of settings and having these conversations, it is likely because you are trying hard and you are a really good person and you really believe in the values that you, that you stand by, which are about us coming together and doing this work. Um, and so it makes us anxious because we don't want to mess up. Back to Mr. Smooth's point, right? So we need to figure this out about how we, you know, what we need to show up and show up fully. Um, and this, this is something that you will find out more about yourself um, when you choose to engage in these conversations and, and hopefully come participate in our dialogues. But that mindfulness is so um, important and valuable. So the last, very last thing, and you can do this um, in small little clusters, you don't have to find one person, but I want you to just spend a couple minutes um, chatting about um, the evening. Um, we've almost come to the end here, believe it or not. And um, talk about what is it that you think is particularly useful for remembering or practicing when you think about becoming more color conscious, color brave, in these conversations and in this, this community that we are in, or if there's something else that you just wanna name here as we're kind of trying to digest a bit of, of what's been shared. Okay, so I'm gonna give you a couple of minutes for that and just want you to, um, you can just turn to someone close to you in little clusters so you don't have to get up at this moment and it'll help you um, stay focused in this space. So just turn someone close um, and reflect on that question for a bit. Okay, I'd like to ask you to wrap up your conversation, please. I'm sorry to interrupt. Thank you so much. All right, we'll do it one more time. If you can hear me, raise your hand. Awesome, thank you, thank you. So, one of the things that um, I get asked a lot at these kind of events, either um, during or after, is, so Debbie, 
I was looking around the room and I saw that I see the same kind of people, same people specifically, <laughs> that show up for these things. And how do we get the other people to come who really need to be here? <laughs> Let me tell you that there is no marketing campaign that exists that I know of that gets folks who don't normally come to these things to come to these things just by seeing a flyer or an email. Think about it. Think about all the things you don't go to. Are you going to go if I send you a flashy email or flyer? It's still the thing that you don't want to go to. It doesn't matter how it's packaged. However, if a friend, a neighbor, or a colleague says, hey, Millie, I think you would really enjoy this. I think it'd be really important. I'll go with you. I'll pick you up. We can have dinner before or after. Because I guarantee you, let's, let's do a, raise of, a show of hands, because I think it'd be at least half of you. Know someone in your circle, maybe you're not BFFs with them, but you know someone in your circle who really should be coming to things like this. You really would want them to come, but they don't. How many of you have someone like that in your circle? Okay, look, if each of you leave here today and you know that per you have at least one person in your mind, and you invite them, personally invite, don't forward the email. <laughs> I am talking about a personal invitation that says, Jose, Bob, Julie, I'm going to this thing. I'd love for you to join me. Can I pick you up? That's what it's going to take. Because I don't know all those people that you just raised your hand thinking about. I know my own people. So if we all did that, think about what could happen next time. And lastly, I want to, before we do the wrap up here of our closing, I want to let you know that when we enter in dialogues, we want different things, and I mean that individually, but also one of the things that the different uh, research has shown about why white people show up for dialogues on race um, versus why people of color show up for dialogues on race, white people tend to show up because they want to increase their awareness. They want to learn, they want to grow, they want to be better, do better. People of color show up because they want things to change. So to that, I would like to close with um, Miss Angel Kyoto Williams who's going to be in our area at the end of the month. But yeah, that's right, at Overlake School. Yeah, it's funny, I was just speaking about that uh, to a friend as I was on the way to have this conversation, um, that there is this place of vulnerability from which truly transformative action must come from is what I have discovered and kind of wrapped my whole language and view around is that we can take action and we can take very skillful action. You know, don't get me wrong in any way. There's an enormous amount of advocacy being done, uh, very hard choices that people are right. making to put themselves on the front lines. Uh, but without this particular place and location of a willingness to be flexible, open, soft-bellied enough yeah. to be moved by the truth of the other in whatever given situation, then it is not transformative. It's change, maybe. Mm -hmm. It could be moved backwards again, as we can see, a stroke of a pen. Mm -hmm. But for us to transform as a society, we have to allow ourselves to be transformed as individuals. And for us to be transformed as individuals, we have to allow for the incompleteness of any of our truths and a real forgiveness for the complexity of human beings and what we're trapped inside of so that we're both able to respond to you know the oppression the you know the aggression that we're confronted with but we're able to do that with a deep and abiding sense of and there are people human beings 
that at the other end of that baton, that stick, that uh, policy, that are also trapped in something. Mm -hmm. They're also trapped in a suffering. And for sure, we can witness that there are ways in which they're benefiting from it. But there's also ways, if one trusts the human heart, that they must be suffering. And holding that at the core of who, who you are when responding to things, I think is the way that the only way we really have forward to not just replicate systems of oppression for the sake of our own cause. Yeah. That, that kind of discernment is also about knowing ourselves, and uncomfortably knowing ourselves. Well, I, I think it's uncomfortably, it's actually uncomfortably unknowing ourselves, you know? <laughs> it's, it is this willingness to like keep being willing to come undone, to do what we can to understand the world around us and how it, we operate and what is impacting who we are and how we are, and to allow that to keep coming undone. That's what I think is really the, the paradox in what is possible in from a liberatory standpoint is to recognize like, oh, we're not trying to become something. We're we're trying to un yeah, unbecome. Right. We're trying to undo ourselves. And and that is really what, what is most challenging for us because we we want to be known to ourselves. We, we want to be known to others. But the moment we try to do that, we're actually fixating in a way that traps us, so we feel both safe, but it's also confining. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for being here. Thank you for showing up. Thank you for being here for one another and for yourselves. Appreciate it. I want to talk to you a little bit about some next steps. James, can you come up too? To uh, I just want to pull up our um, information here. And where are the paper forms for the feedback? So you've got them in the back, Jen. Thanks. Great. <clears throat> Thanks, All right. James. First of all, can we um, thank our trainer today, Debbie Lacey. She is a true rock star. Uh, it's ridiculous that she is actually a member of our community and uh, chooses to pour in uh, to us here. So we um, thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm a, I'm a huge fan. Uh, love to learn under you. Um, we would love for you to take uh, a survey uh, to just give us some feedback on the evening. Uh, I am not 100% certain if the, the survey is the same thing as what's on the piece of paper. Yes, so uh, if you do the paper, you don't have to do the survey. Um, so just do the paper, don't do the survey. But if you're online, like do the survey, like that's, that's what you do. We do appreciate you doing it online if you can, only because it helps in the compiling of stuff later. Right. But we do want to respect that you um, can give us information any way that you want. Um, feedback Great. is welcomed. Uh, the other thing uh, to say is while you have a pen in your hand, is to remind you that the way to find out uh, how to participate in the upcoming dialogues on this topic uh, is to reach out uh, to us at kirkland at leadershipeastside.com, kirkland at leadershipeastside.com. Uh, those are going to be on February 1st, uh, which I believe is a Saturday, uh, from 9.30 in the morning till 11.30 in the morning, and then on February 3rd uh, in the afternoon, I believe. We will get you those details uh, in, uh, and as soon as you reach out to us, if you're interested. All right. So the last thing uh, that I'm hoping that we can do uh, is to spend a little time with one another. Um, so we have uh, this space uh, intentionally for at least the next half hour to provide an opportunity for people to connect, continue to talk, uh, continue to utilize some of the, uh, the tools and skills that uh, Debbie has um, graced us with. 
uh, today. There is also uh, just outside these doors uh, an arch uh, and a way to communicate um, sort of your position and thoughts uh, on issues related to race in our community. Uh, and there will be folks out there who can help tell you more uh, about that. And there's a community event happening in Bellevue on February 5th. How many of you have been to Cultural Conversations before? Oh, good, yes. So 10th um, anniversary of this program, and it's the sixth, I believe, right, Carol, of the evening forum. And it's just between us, uh, storytelling, and it's a beautiful event, and, and we'd love for you all to come take part in that. Call that friend up or that person you know, right? Offer to drive, because it's going to be packed. <laughs> all right. So last but not least, what I will say is this. Thank you all very much for coming out this evening. We hope to see you at future events. And it's OK if someone happens to mention that you might have a little racism in your teeth. All right? <laughs> Have a lovely evening. Thanks a lot.